Well, hello there, motherfuckers, and welcome to your Raw Review. Well, you know, Evolution, as I said, it wasn't good. You know, I don't know if I'd classify it as a straight-up disaster. It certainly wasn't one of the worst pay-per-views ever, but it was a novelty act. And you could watch my review, you could watch the pay-per-view for yourself and judge... But I just saw like a squeaky clean SJW feminist thing going on on that show where they were patting themselves on the back. You know, we can do it all. They're not going to be able to compete at Crown Jewel. But however, Renee Young is going to call the action at Crown Jewel to somehow make up for it. You know, um, funny also like on the show they talked about how Alexa Bliss, I think, was the first woman to compete in Dubai, but it's not Saudi Arabia. So, you know, they're like, oh, we competed in, you know, one uh, Middle Eastern country. And, you know, like that, that, that wouldn't be an issue if this was like Israel or anything like that. You know, most people would probably agree with that. Um, so it's funny they, they tried doing as much as they can i felt like this was more damage control for crown jewel because you know they they don't really care about this stuff and when i look at this show when i look at this episode of raw i don't even see any real efforts or progress being made towards you know anything of furthering the women's division and, and we're gonna get to that here on this show so let's start out from the top Paul Heyman, once again, is cutting his promo, you know, oh, here's a heads up, Brock is going to win, it's the same old promo we heard, but, you know, everybody at What Culture, everybody on PW Torch is going to be singing the praises of this promo, they're going to say it's the best thing, even though it's the same exact promo they've been hearing for the past four years. Paul Heyman's been cutting the same exact style promo year after year after year no one calls him on it not a single person calls Heyman on the simple fact that he's cutting the same promo only switching a few things around in certain names it's a copy and paste template that Heyman thinks works the smarks you know pop for it but aside from that you know people like me like the majority of people who are disgusted with this show are not going to be impressed so um, Baron Corbin is in the ring. Um, uh, Strowman pushes him out of the way to get at Brock, but then Baron starts attacking him. Strowman picks him up, gives him the power slam. Brock says, you know, uh, g give him two more. He actually listens to his opponent, actually listening to the guy. You know, he's he's actually listening to what Brock is telling him. Not even, you know, my previous complaints that a monster shouldn't be listening to the crowd. He shouldn't be playing to the crowd. <laughs> hey, you want to see one more? You know, now he's actually listening to Brock. And so what happens to him? He turns around, he gets F5, making him look like a damn goofball. Like... Why would they make Braun look like that? Like, I understand that he's not as experienced as Brock, but is he really going to turn his back on Brock Lesnar of all people? You know, they're talking about his accolades. They're saying how he's in, you know, he was in, in UFC, the world champion. You know, all these different things, and he's going to turn his back on him. And also, the whole entire thing of it, this just being a one-on-one -on -one match, like, why are they not putting Drew McIntyre in here? You know, wouldn't that be the perfect compliment since Roman can't be there? Put Drew in there since he's going monster hunting after all. You know, uh, oh, and you know, that's another thing. No follow-up there. You know, uh, he, he, he hits the kick on Braun Strowman uh, last week. You know, is there any retaliation or does... Drew McIntyre, it's just a one-off thing. He just felt like going monster hunting last week. And, you know, that, that that's it. Uh, nothing else, nothing more from... Um, and, you know, that's also another good point. Last week, you know, when they won the tag titles off of... Um, uh, you know, you know when Dean Ambrose and, um, and, and, and Seth Rollins won the tag titles off of Drew and Ziggler. 
Where was Braun Strowman to retaliate? Wouldn't that have been a better story to have him interfere and cost them the titles? But no, I forgot to mention that last week. But you know, not, nothing about Drew McIntyre. We'll see him later on the show, but nothing came of this. So, you know, if Braun loses here, I mean, you can never expect to see him win this title. Or if he does, it's going to be inconsequential. As, as far as I'm concerned right now, it doesn't even matter. He should have won this title last year. I'm talking about when he faced Brock for the first time, you know, and Brock beat him with the 1F5. And it was funny because, you know, everybody seems to kick out of F5s. You know, Roman kicks out of 5 F5s. You know, Goldberg kicks out of like 2 or something like that. And, you know, and Braun Strowman, bigger and stronger than both of those guys, kick, can't even kick out of 1. So you see the problems of everybody kicking out of finishers and everything, these non-finishing finishers. And so Braun Strowman, I mean, it's kind of like when they awarded the title to Bray Wyatt. It was too little, too late. I mean, after all that time, you know, you didn't capitalize on the peak of that person's career, which is usually when the person's on fire. And you hear that Braun is not getting the reactions that he did last year or even earlier this year. Perhaps, maybe it could have something to do with the constant switches in his character. He's face one week, he's a heel. When really, Braun should just be a tweener. It, it, you know, like, this, you want to talk about, like, Stone Cold, where you should have, like, a character that's somewhere in the middle that doesn't have any allegiances, but, you know, he's taking orders from Dolph Ziggler. He's, you know, teaming up in six-man tags. Uh, he's even teaming up with Jack Doan's son. I mean, where does the madness end with Braun? He was one of the most over guys along with Elias. And, you know, we see that they're doing something with Elias now. But, you know, it's always like it, it's so slow for them to start. Everything has to be a slow burn with them. They can never just do like they did back in the day and just catapult catapult the person right into superstardom it's always you know they, they wait until the star cools off to it fizzles to the shine it doesn't glisten anymore until no one cares about that person um so let's move on we have finn balor defeating bobby lashley by disqualification you're asking yourself why would lashley you know need to have a disqualification leo rush Jumps up on the apron, pushes Balor off the top rope, and it's like, I'm looking at this and asking myself the question, why does Bobby Lashley, of all people, need help for, from, from Leo Rush to beat a guy the size of Finn Balor? Does that really make any sense to anybody? Like, why that needs to be? Why would a guy the size of Bobby Lashley need help from a size of the guy Leo Rush to beat someone the size of Finn Balor. You know, you, you just look at the size of Lashley and just say like how ridiculous this looks and how stupid, you know, they think we are that Finn Balor is like, oh, such a versatile guy that he could, you know, fight people of all sizes. I'm sorry, that's just not how it works. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. It's like, you know, it's funny. Back in the day, they had Rey Mysterio versus The Big Show, and everybody complained about that. I don't know where the people are now when they see Balor against Lashley. Uh, you know, Finn Balor is like, I still can't believe that they gave this guy the universal title. And people want to know why he never got back to that spot it's because mcmahon knows that this guy is nothing special the fans have already cooled off on him and i know you can you can blame management because they seemed hot for him at first but you just need to understand that these fans are fickle the fans in the arenas nowadays are not an accurate representation of who is over with the company and people will disagree with this, but you have to understand it's a lot of the same people. It's a lot of the same types. They're also drawing different types of people. Also, these people were kind of hidden in the crowd amongst all the normal people. 
you know, the, the casuals and just people who are there not to harass wrestlers or, you know, heckle, you know, and, and, and uh, hijack the show. They were just there to have a good time and be a part of the show without, you know, having to hijack it and put themselves over. Um, of course, Leo Rush did his annoying shtick that it, it just, you know, honestly, at this point, it adds nothing. Like, what what is Leo Rush shouting into the mic during the match is doing? It, it's basically like interfering with the commentary, which, you know, by the way, I don't mind not hearing anyway. But I'm just saying it's it's counterproductive to anything that they're trying to do with Lashley. Like, I, I don't get this. You had... Uh, Bobby Lashley going over Roman Reigns, and you did nothing with that momentum. You completely cooled the guy off right after that victory. And that was supposed to be, like, the big moment. Like, you know, you were supposed to give Lashley his title shot. Then you gave the title shot to Roman Reigns, and, you know, I, I, I don't know why they went back and forth with that. It made absolutely no sense, like, you know, aside from if they just changed their minds, and, you know, I, I don't get it, like, so why did you bring Lashley back? I mean, wh what have they done with this guy so far? You know, besides beat up a whole bunch of guys and drag and do an obstacle course, what has Bobby Lashley really done since he's been back? I mean, the biggest thing would have to be beating Roman Reigns. Um... He's backstage, uh, Baron Corbin uh, gives him a slot, and I thought it was interesting how they they took a not a knock at John Cena, but it wasn't even really a knock. Um, Lashley asks, you know, he gets put in the tournament for uh, World Cup. He says, well, I thought the tournament was filled up. Who am I replacing? You know, and, and meanwhile, the news is like all over. Like I said, once again, we're, we're on um, social media, I believe Lashley is there, I don't follow him, but, you know, we're, we're putting everything out, the wrestlers are even, you know, promoting shows, like Mixed Match Challenge, all this nonsense, so, you know, all the news is up, but, you know, Lashley's pretending like he doesn't know that John Cena's not in the tournament anymore, even though he pulled out. Uh, the news on that right now, I think, is they said John Oliver was giving him a hard time when he went earlier this year. I I don't think that that is the case at all. I you know I think maybe because versus last time the whole journalist and media backlash thing wasn't going on, and John Oliver was like a you know one person out of a whole. Um, you know, majority like it is now. No one was really criticizing them when they did the greatest Royal Rumble. When For Crown Jewel, everyone's coming after them saying, how the hell can you still do this show after the whole controversy that happened in Turkey with the Saudis? So now you've got, you've, you know, you, you've got more attention on this event. So uh, Cena, in all realism, you know, like I'm saying, like I said in my other video, Great American and all that. And, you know, I think Cena probably sees this it, as what I was saying for the, the interest of uh, WWE as a company as it relates to them with their PR and that's the key um, acronym there, PR. Cena now is an actor, you know, he's gaining steam in Hollywood, he's gaining steam when it comes to filmmaking, um, he, he's, an, you know, he's a movie star now. So, bad PR can sink his ship real fast. And so, Cena is probably being smart. And he wants to just, you know, do what's right for his PR. Which should simply be to just pull out. And at this point, he doesn't have to worry about WWE fucking him over. Or, you know, jobbing him out on TV. Because Cena does not need them. Anything that Cena does from them from, you know, from the past few years has been a favor to the WWE to provide them with star power, to provide them with his services. He no longer needs their services. They need his. Daniel Bryan, on the other case, we'll get to in the SmackDown review. But we, you know, as it relates to Cena, you know, what did Baron Corbin say? He says, oh, um... You know, he, he that's, so you're taking the place of somebody that didn't qualify. Uh, well, you know, and that is true. He was just automatically put in the tournament. 
Uh, so, you know, they, they were like throwing him out on public TV. I thought it would have been more interesting if they took a shot at him and maybe said, oh, he's not a team player. I was waiting for something like that. But, you know, um, I, I guess, you you know, as far as WWE goes and the style of promos they do, I guess you could classify that as a shot, you know, albeit a very poor one. Um, Becky Lynch is shown from last night. You know, they, they, no one saw this because let me tell you something. If you watch the pre-show, if you watch the post-game show for Revolution, you know, either you got problems or you're a stronger man than I. I don't know which one it is. Uh, because that show, I mean, on the pre-show and the post-game show, I can only imagine the self-serving back padding that they did because they did it so much during the show i can imagine when they're like focused and there's nothing else really going on they're just talking about the show and they're putting it over saying how good of a job they did or on the pre-show where they probably said how good of a job they were going to do then you know i like the headache the would have evolved into a migraine uh, a splitting migraine that probably no aspirin in the world would be able to take care of. Uh, so, uh, in, you know, but anyway, on the post-game wrap-up show, uh, they did this very weird, awkward promo, which they're very akin to, by the way. And that was Ronda Rousey standing in the back getting interviewed. Becky Lynch comes up, says, hey, champ. Uh, Ronda Rousey says, hey, champ, back to her. And then they kind of do this tit-for-tat type of thing. Um, you, you know, just like Lita and Trish with practice. And I understand that that was a, uh, an offshoot of something that happened in the sports world. But whatever, it's, it's just so annoying. Like, that was like, Ronda Rousey is so real world. I mean, it couldn't get any more real world than her when it comes to the UFC. And especially, you know... You want to talk about her, like, airing her dirty laundry, you know, with her mental health issues and all that. You know, I wasn't a big fan of her saying that, but, you know, it wasn't the time or place for that. If she wanted to talk about that on a talk show or something like that, then that was fine. I mean, and she did prior coming to the WWE. As I said, she went on Ellen, but that's besides the point here. Um, Right now, she's like... Uh, you see her there, and she's doing this goofball shtick, which is not very becoming of the baddest uh, woman on the planet. So, you know, it's just basically considered that this is going to be a match because it's Survivor Series, and it's that magical time of the year again when a Raw superstar has to face the SmackDown superstar, you know, so the champions have to face off against the equivalent champions. So the women's champ of Raw has to face the women's champ of SmackDown. So that's what we're going to get. And, you know, they weren't going to, like, they did the same thing that they did last year. No build to it. No nothing. I'll assume that we're probably going to have the same mess that we had last year where we're changing champions around at the last minute so we get the dream matches that will satisfy the Smarks the best. Um, so... You know, I I don't know what to tell you when it when it, when it comes to this. You know, there there was no build or anything. You know, it's one of your top stars in Ronda Rousey, and you're not even going to build up to the match with Becky Lynch. Wouldn't be surprised if that's the only type of interaction we see up until the Survivor Series. Now, here's the funny thing. So Ronda, so Evolution, so important, right? Such a huge historic. Hey, hey guys. It's historic, remember? You know, it was such a great event. We're patting ourselves on the back. You know, we're good little SJWs. We're, you know, doing, you know, what the, the uh, women's rights movement, the feminist movement wants us to do. We're getting good PR, even though we're going to be counterproductive to it and go to Saudi Arabia. But then for God's sakes, you know, the, 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 the girl who runs the... Um, the, the whole entire, you know, women's rights movement at the moment is oppressed herself, um, you know, that wears a head covering. So, but that, I'm not going to get into that right now. Just if do your research on your own. 
you'll see that the whole women's rights thing is a bunch of phony baloney and the people involved are there to make money to get the spotlight when the spotlight should be on a lot of other women and everything you know like i also found that it was really odd that they could have been classy at evolution and i didn't mention this because it was 50 minutes and there was only so much that i could think of in that one review um and I, I thought to myself like wouldn't it have been cool if maybe like to show that wrestling isn't so important and it's not important at all that may be that they honor some other women on the show like military or something like that just to kind of show or um I don't even remember if they even mentioned Susan G. Coleman at all on, on Evolution. If anything, it was a brief mention. And you would think if there was going to be any time for them to parade out Susan G. Coleman uh, people and, you know, uh, people who've had breast cancer, you would, you know, and you know how they like to just parade them out with the belts and everything like that. You would think that Evolution would be the perfect show, and they don't mind making the shows five hours long now. So it's like I was really kind of confused with Evolution and a lot of the choices, you know, tribute to the troops, right? Well, no, we're not going to honor any women in the military. Uh, maybe you want to honor the Susan G. Coleman. Go, no, not in the mood to do that either. Let's just honor wrestling and how important it is to have the first ever women's pay-per-view in WWE. Well, they certainly patted themselves on the back so much for this thing. But, you know, the thing was, for it being so important, Ronda Rousey wasn't even featured on this show live. That was it. All it was was a rerun. It was something that was already shown on the network. Now, of course, most people didn't see it, so it was probably worth replaying. But the fact that they didn't go to Ronda live for comments or anything like that was just uh, confusing because she was like in the main event of the fucking show and they just didn't show her at all. Uh, you know what I mean? It's like they, they showed the Riot Squad on the show. They showed Natalia. You know, just... Uh, they, they showed... um. Uh, who else was on this show? Mm, yeah. you, you just, you know, girls like, um, well, I guess they were on the pay-per-view too, but whatever the case may be, she's the one who was in the main event and she's not there. But uh, but they, pr they you know, prominently featured, like, the Riot Squad and Bayley, who were just in a six-person tag match that was, you know, just basically filler, really, is that all that was. So, but well, let's get to that match. It was um, Trish, Lita, Sasha, Bailey, and Natalia. And you would think maybe since these are big stars that maybe they would advertise that Trish and Lita was, were going to be on Raw. But no, they didn't do that. You know, like last night they could have said, oh, by the way, you know, they're going to... So, I mean, I don't think they're going to be full-timers. I think that this is it. And so they beat um, the Riot Squad, and who else was there? Um, Mickey James and Alicia Fox. So, and, and Renee Young is a very interesting choice of words to describe this victory. They said that they're, Bailey and Sasha are going to remember this moment forever. And uh, it, it's like, wow. They're not fans anymore they're wrestlers but it just goes to show that these wrestlers are like marks you know are, are trish and lita gonna remember this moment forever probably not they're gonna say shit this stuff used to be a lot better the last time we were here i mean man even when trish was at wrestlemania for 2011 remember that one like you know the match with snooki even that was better you know, at least uh, Trish got the team with the celebrity. And, you know, n now she's just on this fucking show. And it's probably looking at the crowd and just saying, my God, what happened? What, like, what happened to this fucking product? She's just there to collect the payday and be about her merry way. And that's that's probably about it. But my God, I mean, like, can you, can you imagine what Lita and Trish are, like, thinking about the current state of this product, like, versus how it was, like, in their prime, you know, or back when they first got there in, in 2000, like, 
the changes that the fucking company has gone through since the Attitude Era and since the Ruthless Aggression Era. I mean, if night and, if night and day wouldn't be able to describe just how ginormous the changes are. So, you know, I'd love to just, like, get inside their head and see what the fuck they're thinking. Like, my God, like, what the fuck is going on here? Like... I mean, and they would not be wrong at all. Um, so, uh, Nia Jax and Ember Moon engage in this little backstage segment that's super awkward. And, you know, like, this is what I'm talking about, Ember Moon. Like, when she comes out, she's got, like, this mask on. She rips it off. Ah, tongue. The, um, uh, what do you call them? Contact lenses that, you know, make her look like her eyes are completely white. I mean, it's a good luck. I, I mean, there's no problem with this girl's look at all. If she acted the part. See, now this is the problem. They assign characters to wrestlers. And, you know, they can get through the entrance portion of it. But then when they, it comes time to cut a promo or wrestle a match, it's like they're not even following suit with how they just entered the ring. Um, you know... Ember Moon and Nia Jax are like talking like they're waiting in line for Frappuccinos at Starbucks. Like they're they're chanting up in this Valley Girl voice. And like I'm saying, this is why Nia Jax cannot be taken seriously as like the next coming of Awesome Kong. Because, you know, well, Ember, I'm going to tell you this. You know, you did a good job, but you just didn't win the the, the uh, Battle Royal last night. And, you know, and um, what, what, what did Ember Moon say? Something to the effect of, oh, she goes, I captured lightning in the bottle. And I'm just like, like uh, you're coming out there lashing your tongue around. You look like a... a you know, a carnivore, like a vampire type of thing, or whatever your character is supposed to be, warrior goddess, and whatever. I mean, it's supposed to be like cool, or whatever the case may be, or what is intended. I mean, Nia Jax is like, you know, I don't know. It's like they seem like they laid off the body positivity thing, and you know, I might be opposed to that, like constantly poking at her weight. Uh, you know, and they don't seem like they're doing that, but I mean, like I said, you know, it's divisive, but go ahead and capture these markets, like I said, with Finn Balor with the LBGT. If you're all about building your brand and you want to appeal to, like, the SJW gods in Disney, then by all means, Lay all your cards down on the table and do just basically whatever the media tells you to do, do it. Whatever, you know, Disney does, follow the template. Because, I mean, that's the way, you know, every other company's going. So you might as well do it, WWE. I'm, sh I'm sure that will help you get bought out a lot quicker. But, you know, they, they seem like every single, like, every single time, this just shows what a shitty-ass company it is. And when everybody always calls McMahon a genius all the time, and they put down people like Vince Russo, it's like, you, you see, like, uh, Vince was not the filter, because this show right now, it's fucking way down, shot fucking 20,000 leagues under the sea, fucking way, way down in the red, horrible. Uh, so you see that McMahon doesn't even know how to capitalize on anything. Like, you see that he's willing to take the writer's like advice on certain things, but the minute they do it, like, ch check this out. Finn Balor, LBGT thing. Comes out at WrestleMania with the hell LBGT type of little mini parade. Next night, the gimmick, it's gone. Sasha Banks and Bailey, they tell each other that, that, that they love one another. We're getting out of lesbian angle. It's gone the next week. Uh, so it's like every single time they keep hitting on something, it's like, I, I don't know. It's I think that McMahon's just not comfortable with that type of culture. And from my perspective, that's a good thing. Um, but from the perspective of his company, it's probably not in his best interest. So I'm just, you know... Unless he wants to go back and 
do controversial shit like they used to, but he's not going to do that. So it's like he's in a weird thing where he's not even good enough to 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 have this be like a squeaky clean type of social justice type of you know sterilized show, uh, you know that like all SJWs could sit down and watch while they drink their soy lattes. I mean, it's just not. Um, it's not something that Vince McMahon is akin to. Now, if he took the advice from his millennial writing staff, he probably would be able to have a show that would probably be um, approved by most... And, and that is basically the audience, mind you. I mean, if you really take a look at some of the comments around the internet and on YouTube, you will see that there are a lot of SJWs that watch the show... Um, and there's a lot of, you know, millennials that are under the impression that this is one of the best times in WWE, even though Dave Meltzer is far from being a millennial. Um, he's probably double the age of one. Uh, but regardless, I mean, it's just like they don't know what to do with any of these characters. Um, they want to make the girls tough. They want to make them equal to men. But like I said, they're, they're basically having them talk to each other like they're at a fucking Starbucks. Uh, so, you know, there goes that idea out the window. Then you have Elias uh, doing a promo in the ring. They, and they did something interesting. He actually went into the back, played his guitar outside of um, Baron Corbin's office. Jinder Mahal blindsides him. And uh, Corbin sets up a match. And Elias beats him in a matter of minutes. So it's like, you know... Every single time it looks like they're going to breathe new life into gender. And here's the other thing. It's like there was no Alicia Fox. So I guess the um, the whole um, gender Mahal, Alicia Fox thing is just going to be kept on mixed match challenge. So it's the same thing with Finn Balor. Like no cheerleading with Bailey, And that was the other thing um, I have to mention. Maybe I'll save it for my SmackDown review. Or maybe I'll mention it in both spots. Anyway, let, let, let's um, <laughs> let's talk about it right now. For people who just watched the Raw review and don't watch the SmackDown review, so in the crowd you had Finn Balor holding up the you know hugger section sign, and you know that's all fine and well, right? He's big old smile on his face, and then in the crowd you've got Miz who's sitting next to his wife cheering on Asuka, who another woman. And I'm just saying to myself, isn't this a little bit weird that he, like, came to Evolution to cheer on Asuka with his wife in tow with their baby? Could be just me, but... Anyway, so they're doing away with the whole, um, gin, you know, gender foxing, I guess, on Raw, whatever. Elias beats him. That's it. So, um... You know, I, I don't know. A match against Jinder is not really going to bring Elias places. But, you know, I liked two weeks in a row. The guitar over the back of Baron Corbin going into the back, doing a different scenario with Elias was refreshing. So they did something a little different there, and I liked it for the most part. Uh, Chad Gable and Bobby Roode defeated the Ascension in AOP. So, you know... You would think with the AOP going on the path to destruction and then being in the main event a few weeks ago, maybe they'd win here. No. Well, they get beat up at the end anyway, but that's besides the point. It's like, who gives a fuck about any of these teams, really? I mean, if you want to make AOP dominant, make them be dominant. But you're not. So, it's like, I don't know what this match was even supposed to be for or why it was a triple threat match. If... Was this like for uh, some type of qualification? Because, I mean, I would assume that the tag titles are now vacant. But were they even talked about? I probably missed. I was probably so disinterested. I probably didn't even listen. So I apologize for that. But, uh, you know, I, I don't understand. You know, it's if this wasn't a... It, it didn't... You know, it wasn't advertised as a qualifier of any sort. So, I mean, I guess it was just a pointless match. I guess we could say it was that. Um, Seth Rollins comes out to cut his promo. Get down here and face me like a man. I mean, like, oh my god. <laughs> I mean, last week, 
I put that shit over saying that that was one of the best moments. They also put a lot of heat on Ambrose, which they acknowledge where, you know, Rollins got um, really emotional and demanded that, you know, Dean get in the ring. And, and I like that part of the promo. I like the part where he mentioned that, you know, this was Roman's moment and you took the spotlight off of him because you were selfish and all that. But the whole thing, the whole cliche of like what they do nowadays, like a man, fight me like a man and all that, like uh, there's just no other natural talk. There's no other like um, everyone uses the same, you know, adjectives. They use the same type of vocabulary. They use the same type of uh, verbs. I mean, it, it, it's just, you know. It's really frustrating to listen to because you know like that a lot of these guys don't want to say this, but it's like they're talking from a template like of pre-rehearsed lines and like everybody gets the same exact thing, you know, and it's getting tiresome like, you know, the, the fight me like a man and Ambrose won't say anything. He's standing up in the crowd. I mean, like the the one night where it, the, first of all, Fuck. The whole night should have started off with Ambrose center of the ring or maybe in the parking lot, wherever you want to put the guy. Just put him somewhere and have him do the explanation. Cut the promo, whatever the case may be. But I know what the thing was. They just didn't want, they didn't know what to have Ambrose say. I, I think that's pretty much what it was. Because every time they have somebody cut a promo explaining why they went heel, it never makes any sense. And I and I, don't, I never understood exactly why. Like, why is it so hard to come up with an explanation? It's like, you thought it through enough to have the guy turn heel on this specific night. Like, you were smart enough to do that. And I gotta say, that was impressive. Normally, that would be a missed opportunity. But of course, whenever they strike gold... Always the very next night, the very next time that they have a show, they always ruin it. And they fucking ruined it right here. Um, Ambrose walks away. We don't see him for the rest of the night. Nor do we see Rollins. This storyline is completely gone, you know. A few weeks ago, they're all over the show. Here, they're done with it in 10 minutes. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know how you go off the air with one of the hottest angles you've done in a while. You excite a lot of people. And then you just completely don't follow up on it at all. Okay, I mean, you know, that's pretty much what I expected. So that's why I'm not really getting too upset. You know, so I'm not ranting. It's like, first of all, after watching Evolution, I'm fucking mentally exhausted from this product. I find it very hard... To fucking, you know, really find the energy to get upset over fucking wrestling when, you know, they just, it, it, I, it's just so funny how they just put so much stock into evolution and that just, I've been watching this garbage for so long that I pretty much predicted that show from start to finish. Or I said, maybe it won't be the worst pay-per-view, but it's certainly not going to be historic and it definitely wasn't. So, you know, I'm not really too surprised when they fudge up the whole Dean Ambrose situation. And they, they, they completely ruined the turn right here. I mean, that's it. Like, that, you have three hours. You have a three-hour show to tell a story. And, and you can take breaks in between and, and string it throughout the show. But, you know, you get it out of the way in 10 minutes and you pretty much tell the world... Well, we don't know where to go, so we're going to just buy time by just doing this. Um, Nia Jax defeated Ember Moon. So, you know, it's like they give Ember that lightning in the bottle, and she's already back to losing. Um, it was a distraction from um, uh, Tamina. So, you know, it's really funny. Once again, they're going back to the whole Tamina thing. And so it's like, why weren't they the last two in the Battle Royal? If they want this feud so bad, and I said that this would be a good feud, why the hell not? Why not make them the last two? But they didn't do it. 
And, um, you know, instead they give it to Ember Moon, who was beat here, by the way. And I guess the timekeeper, you know, whose job is to ring the bell. I think it's his only job. Didn't even ring the bell at the end, making for a really awkward moment. Um, they were having a lot of awkward moments at Evolution, especially during that tag match uh, that opened the show. And here again, with another fucking awkward-ass moment. Uh, so... You know, they're on a real roll, is what you could say here. They're not really too sure what they want to do with anybody in this. Like, uh, first of all, when you watch Evolution, you see that they have no fucking idea what they want to do with the division. They know that it's good to promote women and that it's really hip and all that. But when it comes right down to it, they don't know how to properly promote these girls. And so it's a lot of just wasting time and not really accomplishing anything. Um, Lucha, the Lucha House Party, oh, oh God, defeated the Revival. Did I really just say that? Like, Lucha House Party, is that a thing? Is that a team? Yeah, or it is. So they got... Um, Kalisto, who we haven't seen on Raw in fucking how long since Enzo was there. Um, so it was like the beginning of the year. And then we get um, uh, El... Who, who was that? El Dorado? The road to El Dorado a fucking guy from 205 Live uh, is there. And they, they beat the Revival. Like... <laughs> Then the commentators are going on, oh, these guys are future tag champs in the Revival. And I'm like, what are you even doing with these guys? You had them go over Bobby Lashley and Roman Reigns multiple times. I think it was like two or three times. Then you had them like picking on DX and all that. They And, and nothing came of any of that. They got buried against DX. Nothing came of the Lashley Roman Reigns wins. You thought that that would have catapulted them. But really, what it was is they just needed a team to like cause friction between Reigns and Lashley, and they were just pretty much a you know a a, a, a part to play. They were a prop in that story, I guess. So. Now, like, what do you say here? A random tag match and, you know, this house party, like, uh, is there a reason why this team needs to be here? When you have so many other talents on the roster that you, you're not doing anything with, you don't have Ronda Rousey on your show, but you have time for El Dorado and Kalisto. You figure that one out. I I, I mean, no. Nah. There's just, there's no excuse. There's no reasoning behind it. It's just because, right? Because it's WWE. Um, Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre cut a promo. Drew's pretty much silent through the whole thing. And, you know, Drew's doing the talking for him, saying, you know, he's going to be keeping his eye on the world title winner at the, um, you know, a crown jewel, which, by the way, is a global event. Where's it being held again? Well, they're not telling us, but we know where it is. <laughs> I, I, I still just, I cannot believe that they're going to go through with this on Friday. I, you know, honestly, it is that important for them to risk all the PR they built up over the years with Be A Star, Susan G. Coleman, Kyrus Cure, all of this, the Good Morning American appearances, having wrestlers on Ellen and shit like that, and on the Tonight Show, and you're rip, put that all to the wayside because you're just you want to make a quick extra couple of bucks. And I know it's a few million, so it's not a couple of extra bucks, but my God, like there's. They're coming under all this heavy uh, heavy fire from the media. And it would be different if, like, this was the Attitude Era and we didn't give a shit because we're controversial anyway. But they're not. They, they're they the squeaky clean PG. We're for charity. We're here to help the community. I mean, 
Seriously, I mean, I'm surprised that WWE events don't take place in a church. I mean, just to get it over. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, wow. Uh, I, I mean, or they charge free tickets for the good of mankind. I mean, you know, so, somehow, some way, it's like you knew right from the start that all the shit that they were doing was bullshit. And we knew it. We talked about it here so many times. That whatever they did was just to make them look better. And this really just shows that in the end, when it comes to the money, they don't give a fuck even about that. So, you know, going full speed ahead into this. And, you know, so McIntyre is not going to be in that world title match. What's the last match on this show? Ziggler beating a Apollo Crews. So, so, just to put things in perspective, like two, like what was it, three weeks ago or something like that Cruz walks out completely buries Elias then Elias buries him now Ziggler buries um Apollo Cruz so it's like in the end what the fuck was any of that supposed to be like this is what it is it, it, it basically is it, you know it's like all these writers they all Take a dump in the toilet. And Vince McMahon instructs them to scoop the shit out of the toilet. Then they make a big chart with a bunch of ideas. And they all fling their turds you know, at the big board with all the ideas on it. And you know, whatever the turd hits, they go with that one. And then the next week they repeat the process. And you know, that's basically why everything is all you know, cockeyed and fucked up and all over the place. It's because, you know... It is really that random. I mean, that would be the only real feasible story to explain it. A feasible, you know, feasible story, I guess. That you, you could really explain why any of this happens. It's it's all just, it's a big fucking mess. It's a big fucking mess. And then at the end, we got uh, DX. So, you know, and it was really funny about this little DX Brothers of Destruction segment because it was almost exactly like the opening segment. So, you know, Brock Lesnar tells Braun Strowman to continue to power slam Baron Corbin. Braun's like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it there. You know, so he goes ahead and he does it. So he power slams him a, a, a few more times. And, you know, Brock just comes up from behind, F5s him. Makes him look like he's a fucking idiot without a brain in his head. So then Triple H comes out on the stage. Shawn Michaels not there. Oh, where is he? You know, Triple H does one of these classic little pointing gestures. And then, you know, uh, Undertaker then remembers, oh, people can attack me from behind. They've been doing it for about 30 years. Then he looks behind him, and him and Kane get blindsided from behind. I, I, I mean, you know, we talk about how The Undertaker and Kane are veterans. How they're legends. You know, how they're experienced and all that. And they don't, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, you, you gotta think about the psychology of it. And, like, these characters. Would they be fooled by a sneak attack? Like, if they were rookies, it would make sense. But this is how cookie cutter it is. Even The Undertaker would get fooled by the same exact shtick that occurred in the opening segment. So there you go, guys. We're off to Saudi Arabia. You know, the... the, the <sighs> I mean, really, it, it, it's like if... I think WWE should just cancel all of these fucking shows. Retool, rebrand, fucking go home and think about their lives. Such a fucking awful show. Such a fucking awful show. From top to bottom, I mean, this whole show was abysmal. Uh, horrible. I, I, I mean, you, you had... The best thing on the show last week. Some, they haven't had something that hot in a long time with Ambrose. Completely cooled it off. Wasted no time. Not even a week passed. Already cooled that shit off. Didn't even have Ambrose say a word. He pulled a Jericho. Remember when Jericho returned in like 2012 and he wouldn't say a word? Well, this was no better. I mean, this like, wow. They fucked that up really badly. 
Then you have the, the ridiculous opening segment, and then the one with The Undertaker, which was almost the same fucking concept. And then Ronda Rousey, who is, you know, your star player, this the, the one who's getting honored at the end of the night for, for your big evolution, your big historic pay-per-view. And she's not even on the fucking show. I mean, if you don't call that a bad show, I don't know what is. I mean, you know, the Lucha House Party wrestled on this show against the Revival. Need I say more? Need I really say more just how bad this show was? All I have to tell you is they had enough time to have a match with fucking uh, the Lucha House Party featuring El Dorado. (sighs) Anyway, guys, um... Hope you all enjoyed the video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And make sure that you're still subscribed. I'm on the road to 6,000 subscribers. I Hopefully, you know, I'm pretty sure we'll get there by the end of the year. Click the bell so you get all the notifications when I post all my new videos. Check out some of the other videos I have posted here. And until next time, motherfuckers. This has been your YWC champ. Sign out, by the way. Almost forgot to do the little end there, but there you go. See you for the SmackDown review.